Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to the Law, Politics, and Media Lecture Series. This is a lecture series that we run every spring. It is co-sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Judiciary Politics and the Media, which I direct. My name is Keith Bybee. And by the Tully Center for Free Speech, which is directed by that young man right there, Roy Gutterman, who uh, not only asks for the truth but can handle the truth. We bring out a series of speakers every spring um, from both the bench, the bar, the world of policymaking, and the press to address issues under this large umbrella of law, politics, and the media. Um, and we look for, but don't always find, someone who can talk about topics that touch on all three of these domains. Uh, but today we have a person who can address these things and a, a very distinguished person indeed. Uh, it's our honor and privilege to have with us the Honorable Jonathan Lippman, who's the Chief Judge of New York State Court of Appeals and Chief Judge of New York State. Uh, Chief Judge Lippman is a native New Yorker, and his career in the New York State judiciary uh, spans four decades, uh, beginning as an entry-level court attorney in the Supreme Court. He's held many different posts, uh, both as an administrator and as a judge. Uh, in fact, uh, from January 1996 to May 2007, he was chief administrative judge for all the New York State courts, and he is the longest uh, serving person in that role in state history. He was appointed to his current position as chief judge of the state and chief judge of the Court of Appeals by Governor Patterson in January of 2009, and he was confirmed uh, by the New York State Senate the following month. Uh, chief Judge Lipman has dedicated himself to fostering a justice system that is independent, open, accountable, and responsive to the people that it serves. He's played a central role in many areas of judicial reform. Uh, in fact, I, it's really uh, an understatement to call him uh, a leader in this regard. Um, he's just a remarkable commitment uh, to judicial reform and to improvement of, uh, of the judiciary. In 2008, uh, Chief Judge Lippman received the William H. Rehnquist Award for Judicial Excellence, which is a reward presented once a year by um, the Chief Justice uh, of the United States to a state court judge who exemplifies the highest level of judicial excellence, integrity, fairness, and professional ethics. And um, I anticipate that all would agree that uh, in 2008, this recipient is well deserved for this award. It's hard to imagine, in fact, someone uh, who would be better suited to such a distinguished award. Chief Justice, uh, um, Chief Judge Lippman will be uh, talking about judicial independence today. The title of his lecture is Preserving Judicial Independence, the Chief Judge's Recipe for New York. Uh, he plans on speaking for about 20 or 30 minutes, and we'll have opportunity for uh, Q&A with the audience. Uh, and we look forward to a lively and informed discussion. Please join me in welcoming Chief Judge Lippman. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Keith, for having me, uh, Hannah, uh, having me to law school. It's such a uh, pleasure to be at this kind of multidisciplinary uh, uh, lecture, and we'll try to uh, put together some of these uh, different issues uh, relating to law, politics, uh, and the media. And I do want to talk today about uh, judicial independence and how to preserve it uh, in New York. And um, I think the judiciary and uh, the legal profession really uh, have some worry about judicial independence based on the uh, pressures of, in particular, politics and money and how they impact uh, on the judiciary, on the courts, and on the, the legal, legal world. I think it it uh, so important that the judiciary be perceived as independent, nonpartisan, apolitical, and so much of that is determined not only by uh, the individual person's interaction with the uh, uh, justice system, a juror, or a case, but also how we're presented uh, uh, by the media, uh, by the print media, by the electronic media uh, about who the courts are, you know, or what the courts are, are really all about. Um, we have a system of checks and balances in this country. 
Uh, we are, by design, uh, the non-political branch of government, the neutral arbiters of disputes. When we come on the bench, we take off our hats as Republicans, Democrats, whatever political party, and we join the non-political uh, branch, the non-policy-making uh, branch. And I think uh, this idea of judicial independence is so important uh, to critical to the courts, to justice, to our liberties, and to our freedoms. And that's why the ABA this year has put together a task force on the preservation of the judiciary, because I think so much is at stake, and I'll go into some of the issues. Uh, basically, uh, uh, chaired by uh, David Boys and Ted Olson because of really the attack in so many regards on state judiciaries, and in particular, and I'm going to start out with this issue, on the, the funding. There are three principal issues that I'll talk about today and try to kind of weave them together that uh, threaten judicial independence, I believe. And the first one, which was really a basis of this uh, ABA task force, and, I, and before I do it, I'd be remiss, though, if I didn't mention that the chief administrative judge of the state courts, Gail, uh, A. Gail Prudenti, is here. I'm so pleased. The uh, deputy chief administrative judge for the courts outside New York City, Mike Kakoma, and uh, someone you should uh, all be uh, familiar with, Jim Tormey, the administrative judge uh, for the 5th Judicial District uh, focused here in Syracuse. The, the first issue, though, that, that relates to this, again, what I consider uh, uh, this danger to judicial independence is court funding. And around the country, you'll find that state judiciaries are under attack. There's a cost-cutting frenzy in Washington and in the states and here in New York. And I'm not saying uh, uh, something that isn't maybe long overdue, that we uh, balance our budgets. But that being said, the judiciary in particular has no seat at the table and really has become a target, uh, we feel, uh, and, and unjustly so, with maybe a lack of recognition of how important the judiciary is to our uh, tripartite system of government. Um, I believe that if you look around the country, you'll see so many judiciaries with layoffs, furloughs, closings, uh, that the question to me is not why should we be treated differently than everyone else's budgets are being caught, uh, 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 cut. To me, the difference is, uh, the question is, what is the consequence of treating the judiciary the same as all other parts of our government and all other uh, uh, go government-sponsored uh, institutions. The judiciary is truly the emergency room for the ills of society. And we see this every day, whether it be in this economy, whether it be foreclosures or evictions or domestic violence or consumer credit cases, they all come to the courts. The things that are wrong with everything to do with our society and life here in New York and around the country, sooner or later, comes to the courts, and particularly so in difficult times, and particularly why the judiciary should be funded in those difficult times, because of, again, the important work that we do. Last year in New York, the judiciary was, the uh, judiciary's budget was reduced by a hundred and seventy million dollars. A hundred million dollars that I, as the chief judge, voluntarily uh, absorbed, saying that we wanted to be a good partner in government, and our partners in government decided that that wasn't good enough, and we should be reduced by another hundred, uh, by another seventy million dollars. A lot of money by anyone's standards. We laid off 450 people around the state, uh, here in Syracuse and every place else uh, in New York. The judiciary workforce has been reduced by 8% between those layoffs and early retirement. We've had 430 closings in the court system that, you know, we close our courtrooms at that time because we can't afford uh, to pay 
the personnel to continue on and possibly have overtime as we go beyond 5 o'clock. Uh, arrest to arraignment times in New York City uh, required by constitutional uh, limitations have been way off because of, again, the reduced budget. Small claims courts around the state uh, reduced in their days and their hours of operation. And there have been many, many delays. In fact, Judge Prudenti is just undertaking a whole program to uh, um, improve our standards and goals, which means cases that go beyond what court uh, uh, guidelines are for how long it should take should, to process cases. And all of these things are in large or small measure attributable to the cuts in the judiciary budget. A state bar study recently graphically illustrated uh, those cuts and the effects on the public. And at the same time, and what's so important, not only is judicial independence and the operation of the courts threatened, but access to justice is threatened. Our constitutional mission is equal justice. If we do nothing else, the one thing we stand for in the judiciary and in the profession is equal justice for all. That's what we're all about. And the poor in this society, here, around the state, are the ones who have been most impacted by the downturn in the economy. And from my point of view, as the chief judge of this state, if equal justice is not going to be what happens in our courtrooms, then we might as well close the courthouse doors. That it, it's one thing to say we need the money to keep the courts operating if we're not at the same time able to say that inside those courthouses, access to justice being served, equal justice for all of our citizens, then it doesn't mean anything to have a court system that doesn't meet that standard. Last year, we were able to achieve $27.5 million for civil legal services in our state. And I distinguish that, those of you uh, uh, from the law school uh, and in the profession know that on the criminal side, we have uh, uh, a constitutional requirement for representation. Uh, Gideon versus Wainwright, a landmark case that soon will celebrate its 50th anniversary, uh, requires representation. There is no such requirement for civil cases where people have civil problems affecting the very fundamentals of their life. So last year we were able at the same time that we were losing $170 million out of our budget, we were able to get $27.5 million under the umbrella of the judiciary budget to help create a level playing field in the courts where everyone has a chance to uh, uh, vent their problem, get a resolution by a neutral arbiter. Um, so it's kind of an interesting uh, mix that, that what we're saying is uh, equally important to funding the courts is what happens inside the courts and having justice for all, and that uh, um, supporting civil legal services, a level playing field, is not only about that it's the right thing to do, is not only about the fact that the judiciary and the legal profession have a special responsibility to foster equal justice, but our argument has also been that funding uh, legal services for the poor helps the bottom line of our state and makes good economic sense. For every five dollars, what our task force on civil legal services has shown, for every dollar invested in uh, representation for the poor, five dollars are returned to the state through decreased homelessness, uh, social services, incarceration, and increased federal dollars that, that come into New York. So, you know, in, in my mind, this is this, this uh, dual uh, uh, goal that we have keep the courts funded and functioning and make sure that, that what happens inside those courts is consistent with our constitutional mission. So what we've had to do to make those two things happen is to do more with less, to let 
at the same time to let the public know what the consequence is, and this is where the media comes in, as to what happens when courts are not funded. The ABA's theme for this year on Law Day is no courts, no justice, no liberties, no freedom. So we're running the line. What we did here in New York was we tried not to whine about our fate at a time when public institutions' uh, budgets were being cut relatively across the board. But at the same time, we thought it was a good thing that the different media, uh, electronic, the print media, saw fit to cover what happens when state funding for the judiciary here in New York is cut. So it's this kind of balance that we're coping with it, we're not complaining, but boy, it's not so easy and the public feels the impact. And this year, hopefully on the basis of how, the way we handled the cuts uh, last year, we have a very good budget that's been approved that rounds the edges on the kind of public impact of what happened from last year's budget. Uh, our budget this year was approved uh, intact. It's fiscally responsible, and yet at the same time, judges get their first salary increase in a dozen years. And I'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. Um, we can undo the damage, or at least a good part of it, of last year's cuts. And this year, we were able to achieve $40 million for civil legal services for the poor in this state, the most state funding in the country, but yet the tip of the iceberg of that problem. And I think we've learned a number of lessons from our experience with uh, uh, the, the cutbacks in the judiciary, uh, lessons related to judicial independence, that what we uh, know we have to do in a very proactive way is to be accountable and credible as an institution, as a third branch of government, to be proactive in showing that we understand that we don't uh, live in a vacuum, and we understand our role as part of state government and yet the unique role that we have to recognize and show that in crisis there is opportunity, that we're able to re-engineer what we do as an institution, and we think we we're able to do that, and recognize that what happens is really cyclical, that Good times and economic times, or this was certainly much more severe than in prior years, come up again and again. And we have to understand that the next time we're going to be able to have to use that accountability, that credibility, that maybe they'll look at us and say, gee, they really are accountable to the public and we ought to be careful before we cut the budget again. Recognizing that while, and I'll talk about this too in a couple of minutes, we have to insulate, insulate ourselves, from, ourselves from politics, recognizing that the policymaking political branches of government and the judiciary are interdependent. We are independent as a branch of government, and that's so important, but we are interdependent with our partners in government in the legislature and the executive, and to build those relationships with the political branches and the leaders in our state to recognize that, that this is the only way you can do business. We can't uh, put up the walls and say, gee, we're an independent branch of government and you can't touch us. It doesn't work that way. And you know, we, we think and believe that we have very good ties with uh, Governor Cuomo with the, the both houses of the legislature. And in the future, we're going to have to uh, uh, depend on those ties when the next cycle comes, because what's happened here in New York, while our situation has stabilized, around the country, it's worse than ever. California, for example, got a reduction in the budget of $350 million. And they're virtually paralyzed. Uh, states around the country are again still doing furloughs and layoffs and all of the terrible things. And to me, 
despite the fact that for the time being our situation is stabilized, court funding is essential to judicial independence, and those of us in the judiciary and the profession have to figure out how to deal with that, and the ABA, again, is working on this, both Law Day and their task force, and it's not a simple matter, uh, but we believe we go to the core of what our government and our society is all about, and the judiciary's unique function as the, again, impartial arbiter, and one that has to be perceived as such, of disputes between individuals, between branches of government. We need that independence, and I'll get to back to how I think we achieve it, but certainly stable funding for the judiciary is essential and a pillar of what needs to be done, both for keeping the courts open and ensuring that equal justice is what takes place uh, within those courtrooms and courthouses, and we've created in that regard a template in New York for, and we're very proud of that, for uh, uh, funding out of the public fisc for civil legal services for the poor on the basis that if the judiciary and the profession don't stand up for providing legal representation, no one else will. If not us, who? So uh, uh, that's uh, one issue that's so fundamental, having the dollars to fund the system and to fund uh, uh, access to justice. But the second issue where money and politics, I think, uh, intersect and how uh, it's covered by the media is uh, judicial salaries. And as you know, uh, the judiciary, till April 1, a few days ago, had not received a pay increase in 13 years. Astonishing. What individual or institution or government worker or anything has not seen a raise in 12 years? And why did that happen? Because the judiciary became a political football, where the other branches of government used the judiciary for its own purposes as a foil for either their own salary issue or other issues, whether it be ethics reform or whatever it might be, they held us hostage. And that's why, you know, telling it the way it is, why the judiciary did not receive an increase for that long a period of time. In fact, it got to the point when you adjusted it for cost of living, the judiciary was actually the lowest paid judiciary in the country because the cost of living in New York is so high. Uh, the, the, what, in effect, judges got raises when the moons were in the right alignment and the politicians believed that there was something good that would happen for them, then judges could get raises. And again, it's a situation where we have no seat at the table, we're a bargaining chip, and no one is looking at why it's important that the judiciary be independent. And, and this is in the context of every editorial writer in every paper in the state, all of the media, print and electronic, was saying over and over again, judges deserve raises, that this is outrageous, that it doesn't make any sense, and still, politics, uh, uh, reared its head, and judges for so many years went without a raise. And why is it important? Judges should not go hat in hand begging to the other two branches of government whose cases we rule on and go and say, please, 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 we're beholden to you to give us, to allow our people to uh, uh, be a profession where they can support their families, to get the best judges, to attract and retain the best judges, we have to go lobbying in the legislature with, with on bent knees to ask them to, to give us a raise, which as a co-equal branch of government should never be the case. It is dangerous. It is wrong. We have as strong an opinion I have of our uh, uh, judiciary, and I think still the best in the country. We have a whole lost generation of judges or uh, lawyers who would not 
seek to become judges because they know there's no future in it. And judges who left the profession because there's no future in it and they can't support their families. The quality of the judiciary is so important to our independence and to be aiming, being able to serve the public. The answer is obviously to remove the judiciary from politics, as it should be. But what's the best way to do that? One way was to bring a lawsuit, which many of our judges did, to seek a judicial pay raise. As you can imagine, the press on this, the media, was terrible, was death on it. What an unseemly situation for judges suing in our own courts to get a pay increase that they haven't had in a dozen years. It just was so, just inappropriate. And yet, well, am I going to criticize these judges who a dozen years ago, their kids are in elementary school and now they're in college and they haven't had a raise in all these years? I wouldn't do it for the institution, although to tell you the truth, um, you know, my predecessor did, and I don't say that critically, uh, because it was such an outrageous, crazy situation. I don't think that's the right to, the way to do this. It doesn't improve the independence or the perception of impartiality of the judiciary for it to sue for a salary increase in our own courts. The right way to do it, in which we have finally achieved, is have a systemic approach where go to the legislature, be persistent, in this case, beg, do whatever you have to do to say, take us out of your world, your political world, and give us a systemic, formal process for regular salary compensation adjustments for judges. And fortunately, we were able to do that with a lame duck governor, Governor Patterson was on his way out, so he had nothing to lose by disattaching us from legislative and executive uh, pay raises. And he proposed, and we supported, and really we had been already advocating it for many years, a commission to make recommendations on judicial pay raises. And in the midst of a rep with representatives from all three branches of government on this salary commission, and the Salary Commission recommended raises of 27% over a two-year period um, that would take effect unless the legislature abrogated it. And we thought that was quite an achievement. And you know what? Many of our judges say that's not enough, that we've suffered for 13 years. And even if you just gave us cost of living, it would be way more than 27%. So to me, we look forward, not backwards. We don't make up for the fact that we haven't been treated fairly. Uh, but I think pretty good in these economic times that judges got a 27% increase starting again a few days ago. Um, I believe that issue is in the rear view mirror, that we finally have a rational relationship to other judges in the uh, uh, federal courts and in other states. But we can never again have that situation happen, and I don't believe that we will, given that we now have this permanent commission that every four years recommends salary increases for judges for the next four years. Because it is wrong for judges to go with their hands out to get the, the basics of a profession to be able to support their family uh, families and practice their craft. So another issue that directly affects judicial independence has all these issues coming together of politics, of money, how we're perceived, how we're presented uh, uh, in the media. Finally, I'd mention the issue of uh, um, uh, judicial elections. Uh, campaign finance reform, judicial selection, judicial recusal, I think are all issues which, again, very much impact on the, the independence for the, uh, the judiciary. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of press attention on our selection systems, what works better, an appointive system or an elective system. Uh, I've been an appointed and an elective judge. I believe that they both have things to say for themselves. 
were very different than other states. In New York, the high court is an appointed uh, uh, judgeship by the governor after a, uh, a judicial nomination commission uh, gives seven names to the governor. In other states around the country, there's great, great amounts of money, over $200 million last year on races for the high court with interest groups putting money in to try, try and sway a high court election. On the other hand, in New York, we have a partisan elective system for the trial courts for the most part, with 75% of our judges being elected. And the bottom line is that there we run into the same problems that a lot of other states who have appointed systems at the trial courts have elective systems at the, at the high court. And what happens is uh, lawyers, anyone else, can contribute money to judicial campaigns, and then the judge has, hears those cases. What could be, in my opinion, more corrupting? Not that I'm saying anyone is corrupt, but inherently, it's a terrible situation to have a lawyer give X amount of dollars, and then I have to sit on his case the next week. To me, it doesn't make any sense, and so impacts on this perception of impartiality. Again, without an impartial judiciary, in reality and in perception, we have nothing. There's a case it, it relates to on the general issue of all the branches of government, the Citizens United case and all the influence of PAC money in uh, uh, the elections to the policy-making branches of government. And in, the, and in the judicial branch, we have a similar is issue with the Caperton case coming out of the U.S. Supreme Court. We're in West Virginia. The chief judge of that court was supported in the campaign with a large amount of money from the coal industry and then sat on a case very important case uh, relating to that very industry and the very people who were giving him money. And the U.S. Supreme Court said it destroys the perception of impartiality and independence and, and what the judiciary is all about. And uh, that case really was a signal to all of us in the state courts as to we had to deal with this issue. And in New York, we've taken a very different view of this than in other uh, states and in the federal courts. The ABA has been dancing on the head of a pin as to how judges, how and when judges should recuse in cases that come before them, um, what, what amounts of money, when they should do it, what the considerations are. We took, a, and in the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, basically, they say no one reviews what they do, that they're the best judges because they're a the high court. In New York, we've taken a totally different approach, that saying that this hurts the confidence in the, of the public in the judiciary and its independence and its impartiality, and therefore, administratively, we're not going to assign cases to judges who have gotten contributions of a certain amount to lawyers within the last two years. If a lawyer makes, or a party, makes a contribution to a judge of $2,500 or more, we don't assign that lawyers or that uh, uh, um, uh, litigants cases to that judge for a period of two years because it hurts what is so fundamental to us, and that is our impartiality, our independence, and that solution is being really replicated in a lot of uh, 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 states around the country. I think, again, it's so important in terms of confidence in the system. You know, there's a case that I uh, totally disagree with, the U.S. Supreme Court, in White versus Minnesota, that you may have heard of, that sort of opened the gates a little bit for judges to talk when they run in uh, elections, to talk about what their views are on controversial policy issues, I think that was a mistake. But even with that, in fact, Sandra Day O'Connor, who had gave the a fifth vote for that decision, says today that was the biggest the mistake she ever made in her career, um, because it makes us 
into politicians. We can't talk about issues that may be come before us on the bench. It's such a terrible precedent. Um, and I think that, again, we're not politicians just that we wear a funny, different costume, but we're just really politicians in the end. That's what it says about us. And I believe that we have to meet this uh, a problem head on, and that's why we've taken this approach uh, to recusal, which is not even a recusal approach that says we administratively are we're going to do what's right for this system and promote the public's confidence in our inter independence and our impartiality. And I'm not saying that there aren't loopholes that you can get around uh, the system, but it has a great deterrent effect, both to the people who are contributing money and to our judges, it relieves them of the necessity of getting up and saying, oh, I did something wrong, so I'm going to recuse myself. We take it upon ourselves as leaders of the judiciary to say that, that that's just not going to happen in New York. And in relation to the selection system, my view is that our mixed system works well. I don't think there's any uh, monopoly on good judges from the appointed or elective system. The appointed system that ideally, and I've been both an appointed and an elected judge, the appointed system that ideally, if it works perfectly, might be more merit-based, in reality often turns out to be another form of politics. That it, that system is only as good as its appointing authority, and sometimes we've had non-political appointment of judges and sometimes very, very political appointment of judges. Whatever system you use has to be meaningful and transparent, and I think that's the point. You can have elected judges, you can have appointed judges, but if you have systems that, that are meant to, to get the best people on the bench, again, neither of them say, gee, the people call the appointive system the merit system, not necessarily so. So I think the bottom line of all of this and these uh, uh, different issues I've talked about today, where again, I think the politics, money, the media, uh, uh, the law, uh, really all, all come together, is that we need two kinds of, inst uh, of independence as a judiciary. One is institutional independence, which very much plays into when I talked about funding and salaries. We need to have, as a branch of government, independence. We also need adjudicative independence, the heart of what we do, that in our decisions, you know, we are held beyond reproach and we are beyond reproach, and that goes into this whole recusal area and indecisions, not of anything that takes away from our looking on the law, what we should be doing in a particular case, and meeting our constitutional oath. The two issues are intertwined both administrative and adjudicative independence. Yes, the reason why we have to be proactive and reform-minded and accountable and forward-looking and transparent is to make clear that as an institution, we are independent and we're serving the public. We need to do like we did in last year's fiscal crisis, show that we can do more with less and yet let the public know what monies that go to the judiciary do in terms of our liberties, our freedom, equal justice, and all of the things that courts uh, need to do. And we need to be scrupulous in insulating ourselves from politics. And by having institutional independence, that we are a branch of government that people respect and understand, are accountable, serve the public. It inoculates us so that we can have adjudicative independence, the core of what we do, so that invariably, when we make decisions on the most controversial issues, whatever they may be, whether it be you know, the education, the funding of the educational system in this state, whether it be about uh, gay marriage or abortion, whether it be 
whatever, the fight uh, between the branches of government on who controls the budget, the legislature or executive, invariably there are going to be uh, uh, half or close to it who don't like what we do because on these controversial issues, were the final uh, uh, resolution of these issues, were the last word, and some people are not going to like it. If we don't behave the way we should as an institution, as a branch of government, then when those uh, uh, um, decisions come that people find, for whatever the reason, they just, you know, are, are absolutely, uh, uh, you know, atomic about why they don't like what we did. We have the credibility to weather those storms when we do this core of what we do, when we do, when we say, when we resolve these intractable, uh, terribly difficult, nuanced cases. So to me, that's what the judiciary is all about. That's what being independent is all about, these two kinds of, of independence institutional independence to show the kind of branch of government that we are and what we mean to the public, which by, by being the kind of judiciary that we should be, uh, that, that looks to be accountable to the people we serve, again, gives us that uh, adjudicative independence that couldn't be more important to our system of government to the reason for the judiciary existing, there is a brilliant constitutional design to our tripartite system of government. And we have to do our part to make sure that that design, that brilliant, the wonder of our Constitution is actually, in reality, comes into play the way it was supposed to happen, the way the founders drew it up. So that's my recipe for preserving judicial independence in New York. Love to take any questions about any of those issues or anything else that you might want to talk about. So thank you so much. We have plenty of time for questions. As you feel free to call on people. Great. <laughs> Who has a question? Keith is going to ask a question if you don't. Yeah, you, know, you, so. you don't want to hear my question. No, yeah. Okay, I, I knew you would. So I, I really like this uh, uh, way in which you think about independence as having kind of two facets right. or faces, administrative, institutional on one hand, and an adjudicative on the other. Um, as you talked a little bit about lunch, you have a very complex system in New York State. Yeah. And we have these lower justice courts, village and town courts. Yeah, which we talked a little bit about. Talked a little yeah. bit about. And I wonder if you could try to fit them in to your model of independence here, because they are, seem to be very close to their communities yeah. um, and don't necessarily, I think, have uh, administrative or institutional independence that you're uh, describing. Uh, and, and so I was wondering how they kind of fit into yeah. the picture of... of and, and, and you know, there's been a lot of criticism about the town and village courts, and there are non-lawyers who preside over it. And what I mentioned at lunch when we were talking is I think there's two sides to this coin. I think, look, in the ideal, the town and village courts should be state courts with the same standards that everybody else has. As you know, they're funded by the localities. While we technically oversee them, they, and we train them, and we give them legal education, the, they are really creatures of local government. And they're in garages and barber shops and, you know, basements where these town and village judges often hold a court, if you want to uh, uh, put it that way. And um, I think there's a lot to criticize, and they are not, in my view, up to the standards of, of our state court system. But, as you indicated, Keith, I think they're the courts closest to the average citizen, certainly outside New York City and in the more rural areas of the state. A lot of these, believe it or not, non-lawyers do very good jobs. We train them. In fact, sometimes they're a little more cautious than the lawyers and, and sometimes uh, uh, less subject to uh, uh, abuse and discipline. Um, so, you know, I think it's a mixed bag. 
Uh, I think we have to continue to do what we're doing. Judge Prudenti will tell you that um, we're trying to pump more money, more state monies into those courts with grant programs. Um, I think we're trying to upgrade the legal education that we give them. Uh, we talked about, do I think in the ideal world that, um, that it would be better to have lawyers than non-lawyers uh, sitting on that bench? Absolutely. Although I would say, as I mentioned when we were talking about earlier, that there have been cases that go up to the Court of Appeals and it is found to be, it has been found to be constitutional to have non-lawyers as, uh, as judges. I wouldn't be surprised if that uh, uh, case uh, comes up in a different form again. In some states, it's been found to be not constitutional and they've done away with whatever you want to call them. You know, we, in New York, we call them uh, town and village courts. So I think it's something that needs to be addressed. There was a multi-part uh, piece on this in the New York Times. Uh, pointing out all the abuses that I think was overdone to some uh, uh, extent, and yet it was a brilliant series that exposed the underbelly uh, of the, uh, uh, the local courts. Um, and that series of articles was bitterly resented by the upstate legislators who felt it was very unfair. So I think it's a, it's a the, the bottom line is eventually, I would like to see them as part of the state court system. Right now, I think they're doing the best they can under, without a hell of a lot of resources, and, uh, um, and we need to do everything we can to enhance uh, those courts and to uh, um, get them better funded in modern technology and legal education. And, and, uh, but I think they're very important to the perception of the judiciary, both institutionally with a lack, like you say, a co co coherent institutional uh, presence, but obviously the things that they do uh, relate to people's liberties, and that's a very serious issue. You know, one thing that I've worked very hard on is to try and get representation and arraignment for every person in this state, regardless of means, and in those courts, they are the, you know, the worst offenders and not having uh, legal representation at arraignment. So we need to put our energies into that. And I can tell you that uh, uh, Judge Gacoma and Judge uh, um, Tormey are very aware of the town and village courts in their district. And on a, 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 a global level, Judge Prudenti and I are, are focusing very much on, on that issue. So, yeah. Thank you very much for being with us today. Sure. Yeah. Uh, the courts in New York generally, uh, particularly in light of your comments about uh, appearance to the public in terms of perceptions of not being politicized and things right. like this. Um, is there a role or what are your thoughts or plans for the judiciary with regard to uh, interfacing with the media, if at all, in terms of using the media or at least being appropriately represented in the media? to the public, particularly in this age of dwindling budgets for both the media well, companies and the courts? What I could tell you, in the best sense of, <coughs> of uh, the way you framed it, we want to use the media. Mm -hmm. And the media is all one means. Remember, we don't have that many platforms. We're not politicians. The chief judge gives a state of the judiciary address every year, and on law day uh, I give an address. but. We need to have, and I pride myself and wear it as a badge of honor, that over many years, you know, have developed very close relationships with the media around the state, because I understand that the media plays such a role in shaping the perception of the judiciary and how the average citizen views us. So I think uh, uh, to be standoffish, and it's different when we talked about the adjudicative versus the institution, we generally say in relation to our decisions, the decision speaks for itself. The judge should say what they want to say in that decision. We don't elaborate on what it says. You read it and we should make it so you understand it. But on the institutional issues, it is critical. There couldn't be anything more important than having the, the media, print, electronic, understand what we're all about, we have to educate it. We have media days, which we've done, where we have the 
uh, the press come in and we talk to them about uh, different issues. But more than that, I think that it's incumbent upon us to recognize, and certainly I do, uh, and my good friend Judge Prudenti is becoming very, very familiar on a daily basis with talking with the media, because that's all one vehicle to get out our apolitical, nonpartisan, impartial uh, 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 point of view to show we're accountable, that all we're interested in, we don't care about the Republicans, we don't care about the Democrats. What we care about is serving the public and meeting our constitutional mission. So I think the media is vital to, to those issues we talk about today, independence both on the institutional side and again giving us the credibility so when people don't like what we've done or you know object to it on the institutional side, we're, we're inoculated that, gee, but, but that's an institutional branch of government that we can be proud of. So, yeah, thank you. Because uh, having been a former media member in yeah. Albany, I know there were some courts where there were yeah. judges who loved to have yeah. cameras in the courtroom and others who absolutely, well, I'm even, a, if, even if the lawyers didn't yeah. have a problem. I'm a big fan of cameras in the courts. We were talking a little bit at lunch. I can't understand the United States Supreme Court, which doesn't want the public to see the critical work that they do. These cases affect every citizen in our country. Isn't it ludicrous that you had Obamacare to use a, uh, uh, a media term, come up with a whole nation is looking at this, and we have, you know, audio uh, 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 versions of what happened, and you can't see the arguments. You know, when you lose half of it by not seeing uh, the visuals. So my view, and at the Court of Appeals, our high court, all our, our arguments are uh, available to the public and videotape. I think it is, and I said this at lunch, that it was up to me, and Jimmy, don't get upset. What I would do is I would video every single court proceeding in this state and put it on the internet so the people could see the important work that we do. And if you did that, you would then have, no one would even know the camera's there. You just put it in the back of the courtroom and that's what you do. And i kidding with Judge Tommy because our judges would not like it. But you know what? In a very short period of time, They'd get used to it, they'd forget it's there, and the people would see what they do and why it's important. So I think it would go a long way towards promoting respect for the judiciary and its independence, and I'm not afraid at all to let the public see what we do day in, day out. Are we perfect? Nothing is perfect. You know, and I think the big rap on that really was the OJ case, where people felt that uh, um, that case did not promote respect for justice, for the legal system, for the rule of law, because of the uh, um, performances that went on in that, in that courtroom. I think it was a unique case, and believe me, I'm not saying that it shouldn't have been televised, but it did create a lot of this, let's put the walls up and not televise it because it became a circus, you know, rather than, uh, uh, you know, an education in, in what the court system is doing. So, yeah. So you mentioned the, um, the health care committee's expenses to the other one. Yeah, there. capered into the other one, yeah. Um, so my question is, is, do you think the current Supreme Court is politically independent right now in terms of its makeup? Uh, well, look, I have my own criticisms of, of the Supreme Court and various decisions that they do. Um, I don't buy into the argument that, you know, uh, uh, our system makes sense, that you have a president who's elected by all the people, you appoint the justices. When we, when we go on the court, we don't take away our life experience or where we come from. There's a reason why people care as to who gets elected, because it affects things like the Supreme Court. I don't think that, and I think it, it diminishes us if we take the most uh, um, negative view that, oh, this is political, that's political, that doesn't mean that we don't take all of us, depending on our own life experience and our own perspective, take a particular case, whether it be Gore v. Bush or whatever it might be, and say, 
gee, I think that was a political decision. I can only tell you, and I certainly am not going to say, uh, 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 you know, be cynical about anyone's motives. When we come up to our high court, we have a, uh, a split on our court of four uh, judges appointed by a Republican governor and three judges appointed by a Democratic governor. Um, if you look at our cases, and we have a lot of four to three uh, votes on all kinds of cases, they don't necessarily, very often, do not break along partisan lines, and occasionally they do. And people are going to say, oh, that was a partisan vote by the more conservative judges or the more liberal judges. What I can tell you, and I don't believe the U.S. Supreme Court is any different, that when we get a case, we don't talk about it with each other before it comes on. We don't talk about what's the liberal position or the conservative position. Um, we do what we think the law is. And that's not to say that we don't have, if you know the, the, uh, uh, the mantra about the court that I had, uh, since I've had it, headed it for um, three and a half years or whatever it is, that my predecessor, who was a spectacular chief judge, Judith Kay, believed in consensus. And they had a lot of cases that were 7-0 unanimous decisions. In order to get unanimity, you have to round the edges on your decisions and, and compromise and say less. I happen to believe that you're better to have a clear uh, majority opinion, a clear dis dissent, clearly articulate the law, and you can say what you believe rather than so watering it down by trying to get unanimity. And yes, sometimes when you do that, you get a decision that people will say, oh, look at that, it's the four Republican judges or the three Democratic judges uh, or whatever. Yeah, sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't. But, but I can tell you the way a collegial uh, uh, a court uh, uh, works and again, we take off our hats, Republican or Democrat, when you're on a court, we don't take off our life experience. So it doesn't mean that we all look at the cases in the same way and from the same uh, perspective. You can tell who the liberal and conservative judges are. You know, it's apparent. You know, read my decisions. You'll know where I stand, <laughs> clearly. But what I'm saying to you is we don't look at it like that. I say what I think, and I say it clearly, and that's what my colleagues do. And I think it's the same thing on the U.S. Supreme Court. To say that, and, and I'm not saying you're saying that, but I'm just trying to give my own, my own view of it. Because you're a Republican or a Democrat, and you make a decision that is in keeping whatever that party's philosophy or whatever is, doesn't mean that you haven't in tried to interpret the law in an impartial way and do what you think is right. And I said at lunch today, and I'll say it publicly, look, don't believe this stuff when you see these U.S. Supreme Court confirmations. And they ask the judges, you know, about what's your view on this, and they say, courts don't make policy. You know, we just go on the law. I don't know anything about policy. You know, no, I, I don't have any views on anything. You know, the other extreme. Um, we just follow the law. Well, you forgive me. You know, that's, that's, that's not the case. The U.S. Supreme Court, the Court of Appeals of the State of New York, or the highest level appellate courts are law slash policy courts. And I mentioned this at lunch when we were talking together, that I always ask, in almost every case, look, counselor, put aside the, your legal position on this case. What's the rationale from a policy perspective as to why you're taking the position you're taking. Policy-wise, you say the legislature meant so-and-so or so-and-so. Why? What were they trying to achieve? What, what's the policy that makes your interpretation right? Why to forget the law altogether? Why is this fair? And that question sometimes, we were talking about uh, earlier, sometimes throws them, well, what do you mean fair? I'm telling you this is what the law is. And I say, forget what the law is. Why is this fair? Because in the end, as I said to you in the course of my remarks, what we're about is justice. 
We're not producing widgets in a factory. We're not there to say 23 cases in this week, 23 cases out. What we dispense, what we administer, is justice. And on top of that, justice for everybody, not just for those who have money or those who have status or those who have a particular position in life, but equal justice for every citizen of this state. And again, we, we come at it from our life experience, from the way we view the law. I'd be less than, than, than forthright with you if I didn't say that you know, the judges, whether it's in the high court or on, I, or on, uh, on my court, can't be uh, uh, pegged, you know, as more uh, interested in, in defendants' criminal rights or more, uh, uh, you know, favor of the prosecution or on uh, civil cases, more plaintiff-oriented, defendant-oriented. But it's not because we come to the case and say, gee, I'm going to fine for the plaintiff today or I'm going to uphold defendants' rights. It's because we're chosen as a judge to exercise our judgment, to interpret the law, and, to, and, to, and, and on the basis of our life of experience and who we are, hopefully when we talked about judicial selection, that's why someone gets to the bench. Because, not because the appointing authority or the people in the election believe they're gonna decide exactly the way I want them to do. It's because this is the kind of judge that we want on the bench. So, you know, I'm very proud of our court, and, and I think our system of justice is unmatched in this world. The difference between us and everybody else is the rule of law and this commitment to equal justice. And that difference even holds in a lot of places where you would expect to have that same commitment and don't compared to the United States of America, and in my opinion, compared to justice in New York. Such a long answer to whatever question we're at. <laughs> but what, what, other, uh, what other questions do we have? Yeah. Well, this might be the last one. Okay. We're making a plane. That's why Keith did so. Uh, keep it, yeah. I'm trying to make it short. Sure, no, no, don't worry. Thank you, though. I just we missed the plane. We get to stay in Syracuse. You have such beautiful weather here. <laughs> what could be better? <laughs> It's a good, it's a good question. The basic answer that we got is what you, know, you indicate. Yeah, we know it's a good thing to help poor people have legal representation, and we're talking about the necessities of life, the roof over someone's head, evictions, freedom from domestic violence, uh, you know, consumer credit cases, livelihoods, families. Their answer was, well, yeah, that's a good thing, but we don't have any money. So what we tried to do, and I touched on it in my remarks, was to do a couple of things. One, to say, this is not just about doing good deeds, and we think you should do good deeds. This is not just about we as a judiciary and a profession have a particular constitutional and professional mission to you know, promote equal justice. You know, this goes back thousands of years, it goes back to biblical times. Justice, justice shall you pursue for rich and poor, high and low alike. That's what we're all about, and it resonates just as strongly today. So, but part of it is to say, but not only all those things, it also makes economic sense for our state, and, and this $5 for one, and we had testimony at our hearings that I did around the state, from the landlord association, from the head of the biggest banks, from the head of the business association, saying that don't let these people fall off the cliff, because if they do, our bottom line is hurt, because you don't have people in the communities paying taxes, being at the stores, putting money in the bank, and so that kind of counterintuitive support is very helpful. And the other thing that we try to emphasize is that this is an issue of prioritization. We do not say that we're not going to have schools this year to educate our kids, or we're not going to have hospitals to treat our sick because we don't have any money. Well, you also can't say that we're going to let these people fall off the cliff 
and not support civil legal ser services for the poor, for the fundamentals of life, because, gee, we don't have enough money. It costs too much. And I think the combination of making, appealing to their best instincts, but yet also being very practical in terms of the benefits to New York has really allowed us to, again, we have the most state funding in the country, um, and yet let them understand, which is what our hearings found, that at best we're meeting 20% of the civil legal service needs in this state. And I give you an example, and I'm sure it's not that different here. In New York City, for every one person accepted by the Legal Aid Society for, to have representation in a, in a civil case, eight to 10 are turned away. So the need is so great, but beyond that, you know, we have to work with our partners in government for them to understand why it's good for the state and why it's as important as all the other societal priorities that they've laid out. So, so far, so good. <laughs> we'll keep going. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it.